completely changing our mindset to a full teaching and mentoring kitchen where you know before i could find people that had basic cooking um, foundational cooking knowledge and skills um, even that's hard to come by right now a lot of people have just left the business the the main remedy for us is just to teach i mean i just find try to find people that have a good attitude and fit in with the team that's the most important thing for us at this point hey welcome back and thanks for being with me on the podcast this is a chef episode and i really love to, talking with chefs because they are of course the heart of the house but the food and the creation of the food and the inspiration behind what drives people into your restaurant for the food experience is what it's all about. We're also going to be talking about paring down menus because of supply chain issues, because of rising costs, all the challenges and pain points of running a kitchen. I've got an amazing chef. He's going to talk about mentoring and how you can bring up good people in your own organization, because that's important also. Thanks so much. A big thank you to the sponsors of this week, Works, Smithfield Culinary, The Birthday Club, and Serve the Hospitality Training App. So check out all these sponsors and on with the episode. You're tuned in to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. Powerful ideas to rock your restaurant. Here's your host, Roger Bodwin. Restaurant owners and managers, listen, this is important. If you haven't heard of the employer retention credit, your business can receive lots of money back from the IRS, money you've already paid in payroll taxes. Now, the ERC program, as it's known, is available if your operation had fewer than 500 employees, you had to shut down or partially suspend your business, or you had at least a 20% reduction in business due to COVID-19 in any quarter of 2020 and the first three quarters of 2020. Now, how much is the credit? Up to $7,000 back per employee per quarter for 2021 and up to $5,000 per employee in 2020. Listen, if you have 10 employees today and meet the requirements, you could receive up to $260,000 back in a refundable tax credit. Now, the faster you apply, the faster you get the cash. Think of it as found money that you can use for any purpose, payroll, cost of goods, business improvement, or other business expenses. Again, best of all, you do not need to pay this money back. Now, Works is a company that will do all the heavy lifting for you and get your business back the money that's due. I'm speaking from experience here with Works. I received a sizable amount back in all available quarters from my former restaurant, and I couldn't be more pleased with their service, their people, and their process. For a no-obligation consult, click the link for Works in the show notes to this episode. Don't miss out. Get your consult today. Get everything you need for your operation with Smithfield Culinary. Their extensive portfolio lets you serve up a wide variety of proteins to keep your patrons happy. Choose from Smokin' Fast, which lets you add barbecue to your menu without adding a pitmaster to your payroll. Or browse their margarita offerings, encompassing everything you need for pizza toppings, plus a variety of specialty Italian meats like capicola, prosciutto, and salami. Finally, serve what you love with Smithfield, which includes everything from bacon to hot dogs to deli meats and so much more. For the products and solutions to keep your operation running strong, visit smithfieldculinary.com. Welcome back, everyone, to the restaurant. Rockstars podcast with me today, Chef Mike Harvey, and he is an executive chef and partner with the Queen Street Hospitality Group. Welcome to the show today, Mike. How are you? Good. Thank you. I'm glad you're here today. Thank you so much. So can you tell me your early influences in hospitality and where it all really began for you? I mean, for me, it began as a, a job uh, when I was really young, uh, you know, washing dishes uh, but as I progressed in my career, I originally went to school and got a finance degree and cooked my way through school at Virginia Tech um, uh, and thoroughly enjoyed it and found myself continuously going back to kitchens. Um, and so fast forward, uh, ended up going to culinary school up in Vermont, New England culinary, uh, then uh, worked in French kitchens. Uh, then I ended up being a chef on Cape Cod, uh, coming down to work at a private clubhouse, Cacique on Kiowa. And there, uh, Tom Calico was my consulting chef. And 
it was there that uh, we dabbled in a lot of different cuisines, um, really taking a lot of them to a different level. And uh, the Mexican cuisine definitely spoke to me the most. And I found myself constantly being drawn back to this, this cuisine and the flavors that it offers. Well, I'm thinking there are a lot of people that listen to this that are interested in a culinary career. Like, obviously, our, our cross section of audience is owners and operators and GMs. We also have line cooks and people that are inspired to take their careers to the next level. Let's talk about your experience really quickly at New England Culinary. I'm familiar with that school. I grew up in New England. I know that they have sort of a teaching restaurant. Can you tell us about your experiences there? And if you also learn, say, the financial management side of business, in addition to the culinary skills, and just take us through your, your experiences and work yeah, so in the, that restaurant. The, absolutely. The finance degree is paid dividends in multiple ways as far as, you know, from food cost percentages to uh, labor percentages, what have you. Um, having a good grasp on the financial numbers has definitely helped my career as a chef. Um, but as far as New England culinary, it was, I chose that school after having cooked for a little while because it was a teaching school. Unlike most of the big schools, um, this one, the, the student to teacher ratio was as small as one to three, but at the most one to six, um, we would be, it was very realistic. We were in classes for 10 to 12 hours a day, plus a couple hours of lecture before, after six days a week. Um, I found that it was it was realistic and more got me better suited for what the industry is like as far as the schedule and working and the challenges of day to day as far as what this job entails. Now, in terms of the courses that you selected, did you have an opportunity to sort of choose the cuisine types or is just an overall program where you're exposed to different cuisines from around the world, different influences, the cultures, that sort of thing? How did that work? Yeah, we we didn't choose the the cuisines that were taught to us. However, mm -hmm. uh, at New England Culinary, which uh, isn't open anymore, mm -hmm. unfortunately, but it was uh, it was presented to us by several different chefs that really had a good grasp of different international cuisines, and um, you know we were exposed to a, a ton of different cuisines across the world, and you know just a little introduction into them, do some dishes, understand some of the ingredients and move on. All right. Fantastic. Okay, great. Let's move on. You mentioned having a mentor. What did that mean to you? What did you learn? And is that sort of how you bring up people in your organization now? Are, would you say that you're a leader and a mentor to them? Tell us about that yeah. whole experience and the influence yeah, you have. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I've had uh, several mentors in my career. Um, one was a French chef that uh, I really cut my teeth with at first. And um, he took the time to teach, um, show, and kind of uh, nurture my passion for the cuisine. Uh, you know, it, it, it Cacique, um, it was a bunch of us together as a team achieving that goal with, you know, definitely Tom Colicchio having an influence on that goal um, as far as the style. Uh, and then, but now um, I, I try very hard to be a mentor for uh, the cooks that I have in my kitchen, especially once we had COVID, the lack of labor definitely negatively affected the restaurant. It was very hard to find people that had skills. And we were already, I would have considered us already a teaching kitchen. Um, when we opened Jalisco, it involves a cuisine and a style and techniques that majority of even professional chefs are not exposed to uh, underlying cooking cooking methods are really different than classic French uh, techniques and flavors, what have you. Uh, so we were already kind of a teaching kitchen, but now even more so um, teaching people that have hardly any experience. But the what I tell people when I hire them is it's 90% attitude. If they have the right attitude and they want to learn, I can teach them almost anything as far as this restaurant goes. And so we've just embraced that. My sous chefs embrace that. And we all, we all kind of help each other get there um, together as a team. Mm -hmm. Now, Jalisco is primarily a Mexican concept, heavily influenced by Mexican cuisine and culture. 
Have you traveled extensively in Mexico? Do you pick up new ideas there that you bring back to the restaurant? Is that where it began or tell us about that? No, honestly, I, I don't travel in Mexico very much. And, and I definitely have had the stigma of, of you know, being a, a white American trying to execute at a high level. Uh, uh, authentic, I, w- I wouldn't, it's Mexican inspired cuisine. I mean, if you call it authentic, maybe you could debate that for a few minutes, but yeah. the, it's not Tex-Mex. It's a style of cuisine that really goes back through the history of Mexico, celebrating um, different techniques. We we explore the seven moles of Oaxaca. We uh, do al pastor just like you'd find in the streets of Mexico City. Um, you know, we named the the namesake of the restaurant Jalisco because it's one of the culinary capitals, and it's the it's where all the tequila is made and. We embrace um, a bunch of different regions of Mexico, not just Jalisco, Oaxaca, um, you know, the uh, peninsula, uh, north, uh, west Mexico. We try to find pieces of that all the time and, and explore and develop and, and try to almost educate our customer with what is a really unique and inspirational uh, message through food in this restaurant. Now, do you combine you know, the music and the service and the sort of colors of Mexico in the vibe, how would you describe a, a first time visitor walking through the door as a guest? And what do they experience the sights, the sounds, the flavors, the aromas, like all that kind of stuff? How would you describe that? Absolutely. Uh, what's probably going to hit them first is our really large mural at the back of the restaurant, followed up by the clean cut glass that says Jalisco at the hostess stand. A restaurant's a little more muted than um, uh, some restaurants, uh, intentionally, we um, wanted a little more classic feel. Uh, you'll notice a massive selection of tequila, mezcals, and we even have Sotols, uh, a personal favorite of mine. Uh, d- different uh, festive music playing on the radio. We have a few TVs behind the bar, but for the most part, it's some foliage, some vegetation, um, and pretty clean cut inside. You'll smell um different aromas from the kitchen we have a kitchen inside the dining room and well it's not unusual for us to cook the carnitas and the barbacoa and people to enjoy those smells along with the the aromas that are just going to come from the plates so besides uh obviously margaritas are very popular but it sounds to me like you're also pairing sipping tequilas perhaps with some of the dishes for people that really appreciate fine tequila Absolutely. We have everything from like Don Julio, Julio 1942 to Patron X, which is extremely rare, um, you know, to Sincoro, Michael Jordan's tequila, Sincoro, um, most of the ones that people are familiar with. But we have we run the gambit. The one thing that I will say that is uh, really fantastic about our selections is we also have Sotol, which is not from Agave. Um, it's a bush and it's a. Uh, it's a fantastic, it's right in the middle of the road for me. It's it's not as smoky and spicy as mezcal, but it's got a little more character than say a lot of tequilas. Um, and it's just, it's a phenomenal spirit. Uh, we enjoy having that here. Not too many places have the opportunity to serve that. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it. It's interesting. It must have a completely different flavor profile because it doesn't come from the agave plant. Absolutely. Now, you're both an executive chef and a partner in this company. What would you say a typical day is like if there is such a thing? A day in the life of Chef Mike? How does it it go? I mean, they're all different. uh, I I usually get to the restaurant about 10 a.m. I like to handle most of uh, the office work, all the the back and stuff like as far as responsibilities as an executive chef as a partner the ordering the inventories recipe development um even putting away the orders the whole nine um i do all that before my line cooks get here so that uh, my focus is on them training execution making sure that we put out the best product um possible to exceed the expectations of the customer and uh yeah. And then, I mean, we, I'm usually here till, uh, you know, nine or 10 at night, um, till whenever, uh, service is pretty much done. Uh, I, and it's not unusual for me to work the line. I still enjoy working the line. I enjoy working a station. Um, I still do that several times a week. Um, 
you know, I don't, I'm not afraid to still get in there and rub elbows with the guys. That's great. Yeah. I mean, when you're inspired and when you're passionate about what you do, you've got to get your, you know, your hands in everything. That sounds great. Yeah. Now we talked about labor being an issue. Um, is it still a crisis for you? Have you come up with any solutions that have helped you to get over that? Because obviously yeah. the end result is the guest experience suffers when labor is obviously not optimum and people have to step in and do things that, you know, they weren't doing before and they're taking on more responsibility, but ultimately the guest experiences that. How have you dealt with that? Absolutely. Um, I would agree with that. The uh, we the main way we dealt about it is what uh, we talked about earlier is completely changing our mindset to a full teaching and mentoring kitchen where, you know, right. before I could find people that had basic cooking, um, foundational cooking knowledge and skills. Um, even that's hard to come by right now. A lot of people have just left the business. Um, and I feel like the trend of of people really wanting to be chefs, I feel like is really uh, calmed down some. It was, it's not as big as it was in the nineties and the early two thousands. I feel like there was a little more momentum of people really wanting to be passionate about cuisine and cooking. Uh, but the, the main remedy for us is just to teach. I mean, I just find, try to find people that have a good attitude and fit in with the team. That's the most important thing for us for at sure. this point. Uh, i been doing this for a really long time and um it's a different mindset than it was say 20 25 years ago being a chef and dealing with the labor issues and how the staff is treated is is uh much different than it was back then the way that uh i was treated in kitchens growing up and cutting my teeth were uh, not as comfortable um as they are now i would say but uh yeah uh, we just keep trying to find good people. And if they have the passion, we will teach them. Excellent. Let's talk about the um, supply chain issues. Are you still having issues there? Did it force you to reevaluate your menus, pare them down? There's certain rising costs and availability of product and all that affects the guest experience also because they're used to, you know, having favorite dishes and then suddenly either the price goes up or it's no longer available. Tell us how that's affected your operation. Yeah, that has absolutely been a challenge for several years. Um, it's recently getting a little better, but we still have those challenges. Everything from uh, dry foods, fresh foods, foods, uh, paper goods. I mean, I, th I think at one point I had about six different size to go boxes because every time we'd order one, uh, the next case would be different because they, they'd we they have to source from somewhere else. Um, definitely one of the I'd say the largest challenges that we've had over the last few years have definitely been avocados. Um, right. The price fluctuations, the uh, <laughs> supply versus the demand. You can talk about the politics, the cartels, um, how we treat the avocados. Um, you know, those are extensive conversations. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we've when we first opened this restaurant, you know, the price of, uh, say, 48 counts, nice Haas avocados. We're in the mid, low mid forties per case. We saw it jump to well over a hundred dollars for oh, a good yeah. while. Wow. Um, you know, and just recently yeah. it's been chilling in like the $80 a case range, Still. which is just amazing. I mean, I appreciate what it is. And um, we still produce an amazing guacamole and uh, avocado salsa that feature the avocados we've had to charge accordingly, but people still, you know, we make a quality product. I don't, we don't mix it up with a bunch of filler. They still know they're getting the best avocado possible. And um, we've tried to minimize the impact on the cost to the customer um, through different techniques and, and what have you. So yeah, the, the price fluctuations have been, I've never seen anything like it over the last few years doing this for you know, almost 30 years. Right. And when all that started to happen, there's a certain amount of damage control and communication you have to have with your guests to let them know that, you know, you're, you're running a business. You still care about quality. Obviously your prices are going up. You have to charge accordingly, but you certainly appreciate the guests understanding and continuing to patronize the restaurants. I'm sure all that happened. That's just one sort of line of defense, right? But there is a limit or, you know, what the market will bear when a dish used to be this, and now it's this, but you also mentioned 
mentioned having strong financial acumen. So obviously there are things you can do to make sure that your menus are as profitable as they can be across the board and that you're not losing money on low profit items, taking sales away and, and, and portion controls, standards, and all those other things. Can you speak to any of the systems that you have in place? Because you as a leader and a mentoring, you know, trainer type chef, obviously you have to impart these skill sets on your people that are in the trenches every day, preparing the meals and making sure that the standards are consistent. Yes. And that takes a lot um, of micromanagement initially. Um, and, and you, and you micromanage without trying to breathe over a person, but you ha you're constantly tasting. I mean, this is an industry. You don't just go through the usual routine. You still have to taste. I taste all the time. I, my sous chefs, my line cooks, always tasting, make sure that everything's seasoned correctly. It's balanced that you know like rice isn't overcooked and it's mushy uh beans aren't overcooked you know a constant level um that we execute at it's very high the level we execute at and so it there is a uh, constant checking and rechecking in there and i like redundancies so uh everything i do almost has built-in redundancies um you know i go through the line and check things taste and flavor and my sous chefs will follow behind me and do the same one of our palates could be off for the day it's not unheard of so redundancies are, are built in almost across the board in order to make sure that we are ready to execute on time at a high level for the customer you mentioned you hire for personality and that you can train the skill set it's often challenging because people present themselves sometimes well, and then the performance doesn't quite match the, you know, the, the presentation. And especially in a high pressure environment, hot kitchens, the tickets are on the floor. You've got to be maintain this even keel personality, but then the chemistry amongst all the people on the line has to be complementary. Would you say that you've been able to find that balance and when it sort of goes sideways, are you able to reel it back in so that the guest doesn't see or hear? Because I think you said you had somewhat of an open line. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, yes, it is correct. Um, when I hire people, I have three rules that everybody subscribes to. Okay. So my sous chef's okay. on down yeah. and they involve two of them are teamwork and respect. And um, so everybody subscribes to that right off the rip. Everybody usually looks at me like I'm a little like it's funny because they're, you know, I'm putting it right out there off the rip, you know, that we have teamwork and respect because we're all here to achieve the same goal and that exceed the expectations of the customer at all times. Uh, so as far as the staying even keeled, um, you know, when they when people start, uh, we make sure it's a good fit for both. We the first week or so is a two-way road is what i tell new hires like we got to make sure that they fit in with my team and that they enjoy being around the team also if they're not happy then it's not going to be a good fit so you know we fill out those waters initially but i never have to yell in the kitchen um that's that's 20 years ago <laughs> um, yeah, con yeah constant like gentle pressure constant gentle pressure is what you're looking for uh you know, it's a Danny Meyer philosophy. It's something that Queen Street Hospitality is really drank in uh, from years ago is just that constant gentle pressure. And if we just stay on top of that, there shouldn't be any big spikes of like uh, anything happening. Uh, you know, everything's always on a level playing field, very even keel. Are there any special team building exercises that you routinely implement between front and back of house just to maintain that chemistry? Because obviously, you know, there can often be a division between front and back of house and the way that the front of house approaches back of house in the heat of battle when something goes wrong or I need a reheat on this or whatever it is when they're in the thick of things, you know, there's a delicate balance that always has to be maintained. How does that work in your restaurants? Well, I'd say one thing is the staff uh, really m melds well together, the front and the back of the house. Uh, really, um, there is no line per se. Um, of course, there always is, but uh, it's it's not so cut and dry here. Um, and that's because everybody really gets along well. Uh, they put, We encourage little games, like they'll hide ping pong balls on each other, like maybe... You know, find one 
on the line somewhere and then they hide one behind the bar and it's really random. They play little team building games, um, work together on, on uh, specials. So like we might uh, work as a team on a food special and then get the front of the house involved on pairing it with some sort of beverage, you know, and have kind of a team special beverage with a great a food. So, um, you know, but for the most part, we're lucky we find really quality people. Um, most of the people that we hire are really able to connect with a variety of different people. I mean, like we're very open. Um, we have quite the gambit of, of different personalities, but we just somehow meld together. It just works. Have you been able to recruit when you've got outstanding people and you ask them for referrals and they bring in other people that they think fit the chemistry of your concepts? Has that worked out? Yeah, we try that. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. But, uh, you know, it's yeah. everybody's different. So, uh, you know, it's just having that kind of open communication and open culture, being accepting and, and, and being respectful of people just, you know, on a human level, like everybody is a person and we try to respect everybody as a person. And so I think that that underlying philosophy really just plays pays dividends as far as the staff meshing together. Now you have a Charleston based restaurant group. Have you cross trained people to move into positions in the other restaurants or even bounce back and forth just based on need and they're willing to do so? Have you had um, any opportunities to do that? Yeah, th that's, uh, it, it doesn't work as easily for Jalisco um, because of the cuisine that we do. Um, the other restaurants, you know, obviously very famous 82 Queen. It's been around for almost 40 years and Florence's Low Country Kitchen. Um, they share very similar menus, so they're able to really help each other out a lot more. The transition is a lot more fluid. Um, both restaurants put out great food and um, execute at a high level also. Um, for someone to come into Jalisco, though, is a complete different battle, uh, complete different style of cuisine, complete different cooking techniques, different flavor profiles. Great. What would you say the secret sauce is to a truly great restaurant? And it's so many things. But in your mind, what, what comes to mind first when you say this is a really great restaurant? Is as, as far as from from my perspective? Uh, yeah. And then put your guest hat on. Um, when you go out, if you have time to go out and see the competition or you may have favorite restaurants, when you walk in the door, you can just tell that someone's running on all cylinders versus it's, you know, chaos and things yeah. aren't going well. But it's a combination. It's food, it's service, it's ambiance, it's all those things. But in your mind, it's it's it goes deeper than that, I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would completely agree with that. As far as like at Jalisco, from my perspective, I would say the restaurant's doing great when my team is melding and really executing a, at a high level and everybody is really uh, getting along and there's no problems. Like that's, th that all translates into the food. If we're executing well and together as a team, the food always comes out phenomenal. Um, from a customer's perspective, I, I wear a lot of hats. So right. it, I see a lot of, a lot of uh, things when I go into a restaurant uh, but for me, if the service is, is really good, um, someone's kind of personable and they are there and attentive and they seem to know about the food um, and then, you know, flavor, just as long as the food is balanced and, it, you know, you can always taste if the chef knows what he's doing for and sure. if, the, if the food is seasoned correctly. And so if the food is seasoned great um, and, and the qualities there and the, and the, the service is really nice. Then yeah, that to me is the secret sauce. Listen, I'm all about marketing, but believe me, very few marketing ideas today are fully trackable where you know exactly where the business is coming from. And you also know that it's generating a positive return on your investment. Now I no longer own restaurants, but if I did, this idea would be at the very top of my marketing plan. It's all about birthdays. Everyone has a birthday and they are a huge, let me repeat that, huge source of business in your restaurant. Why wouldn't you want to focus in on reaching everyone with a birthday in your area? Well, you can with the birthday club from FanConnect. Best part is they do everything for you. 
You get a turnkey marketing system that sends birthday cards in advance, inviting people to celebrate at your restaurant from your area code, plus a sign-up strategy for your existing customers. New business, repeat business, higher check averages, and a massive customer database. You can get all this with the Birthday Club. Check it out and sign up now at getfanconnect.com forward slash birthday rockstar. What you're, what you're describing is, is very gratifying and everyone obviously works for a paycheck, but we all thrive on feedback. Are your guests leaving you regular reviews online? Do you read those to the staff? Do you let people know when they've done a fantastic job and when the guests are really happy? How does that happen? Yes. Um, we, we even give spot awards sometimes if someone gets a shout out, say on, on uh, social media. Um, I used to look at restaurant the reviews um, a lot i've learned to not look as often and um realize that everybody's got an opinion and um and that's fine i read them every once in a while just to get a idea of what people are happy or unhappy with um, but for the most part our gratification comes from the customer that's in the building and tells us right then what is happening whether they love it or if we can try to improve their experience um, we find that um, trying to react to people after the fact, um, after they've posted on social media, makes it extremely difficult mm -hmm. to try to make someone happy. And that's, that's what we're here for, is to try to exceed everyone's expectations and give someone the best experience they could have um, when they walk into this restaurant. You're also a personality behind your concepts, and you did mention that you spend as much time as you can on the line, and obviously that's fulfilling for you. But I'm guessing that you're also finding time to get out and just, you know, FaceTime with your regulars and just touch them in a personal way and acknowledge their repeat business, that sort of thing. That's such an important part of the business when they understand that, you know, you're a chef, you're a partner in this business. How much time are you able to I mean, you got to wear a I, lot of hats, like you said. When I yeah, when I can't, when I can't, I do like to go into the dining room and talk to customers and and make sure they're having the best experience possible. I find also because of my perspective, I can usually best steer customers in a direction that maybe they wouldn't have been comfortable going in at first until I can ex better explain to them some of the food. Um, <clears throat> so the you know the, absolutely like the um, the interaction with the guest. And, and, and meeting people, um, I, I, I really love it. Like I like getting that immediate uh, reaction to the food and seeing, especially when people enjoy something they've never had before, which is a lot of what this, this restaurant offers. I mean, last night I even, we were running a special tostada with local chanterelles, um, with some local radish um, on a Monchi Matalas uh, mole, which is like a sweet fruit mole and, and I, I walked one of them out to the dining room to a guy that was just standing at the end of the bar. And like the bartender told me afterwards that like, he was just amazed that I walked the food out to him and presented it to him that he oh, that really awesome. made his experience. And yes. so those little things, like he didn't say it to me, mm -hmm. but those little things really like, I mean, that's what we're here for, right. It's hospitality. Um, is yes. Expected. My job is to put out the best product I can as far as food, but as you know, a partner, like, I have a bigger role and a bigger picture and really just the overall experience. And if it involves me every once in a while going to talk to somebody or, you know, bring out a couple of dishes and just add a little something extra, uh, I'm more than willing to do that. Let me dive a little deeper into your role with Queen Street as an organization, because obviously uh, I'm hearing you spend a lot of time in Jalisco. Um, what do you do and how much time do you spend on the overall organization? And what is, uh, are there multiple partners involved in this company? Yes, I am very fortunate to have uh, Jonathan, Steve and Patrick Kish as partners for this restaurant. Um, Steve started 82 Queen um, and Jonathan has been, and Patrick have been in the business almost their whole lives. Um, Jonathan's a big finance guy. Patrick knows his way around the restaurants in and out. Um, so I'm, I couldn't ask for better partners. Um, we really, uh, I originally came on with Queen Street Hospitality is kind of a chef that was like a tournament, kind of like a group chef, uh, move around the restaurants and help in any way I could. Once they sold an interest they had in a barbecue restaurant, 
um, it freed us up a bunch to open up this concept and really um, show what we had talked about for a few years as far as um, more traditional, authentic Mexican inspired cuisine. And that's what we've uh, presented here. Let me go back to the equation about labor and about the, you know, the hiring style and the people that you bring in. Is there a typical onboarding that happens both front and back of house that indoctrinates people into your culture? And, you know, how do you impart that to them? And what would you describe your culture to be that you want them to understand so that they can assimilate that culture and pass that on to the guests as they get up to speed in their particular position? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would say it's it's all, what I've been I've said a few times, the main thing is the exceeding the customer's expectation in the chair. And, and we try to get everybody to understand that. And that's why, you know, when I when I hire someone that's a line cook, you know, it's very upfront. You're going to help with prep. If you can, you're going to help wash dishes because as the chef partner, I wash dishes still. I prep. I work the lines. So I expect my guys to do the same. Mm -hmm. They see me do it. Um, I lead by example. Uh, I wouldn't expect it any other way. Um, they see my sous chefs do it and it's all the way on down. So it's, you know, I don't really have to say too much. I say it when I first hire somebody, but you see the culture in action and everybody just kind of can't help it and falls in line. Action wants to help because they usually the receive the help also. I see. Yeah. Teamwork and respect says it all. Like that's the foundation. And that's obviously hospitality across the board as well. That's that's great. Absolutely. What's next for Queen Street? Do, are there growth plans in, in place? Are yeah. you going to open more concepts as you know things sort of settle with crazy labor and rising prices and all that? I mean, there is a future beyond the. the yeah, I mean, the future have. is to, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. The the future is to uh, to open uh, more uh, venues. We kick around several different concepts in the same realm from sonoran style uh grill to uh you know expanding what is jalisco um jalisco has so many avenues the cuisine is so multifaceted in so many flavors and techniques to explore i mean we we do tayudas um like mexican street pizza essentially mm -hmm. um it could be its own concept it's such a interesting uh cool street food uh, we play around with all kinds of different cuisines all over Mexico, um, uh, different areas, pockets of flavor um, to where it really it's almost limitless, like the ideas, you know, but the idea is to expand um, the Mexican uh, theme uh, and keep this kind of uh, this kind of homage to authentic Mexican going. Fantastic. Yeah, you're making me hungry. I'm partial to Mexican food and margaritas. So this is right yeah. up my alley. Now, yeah. Charleston is a really historic city, of course. Would you say it's a foodie destination? Is there a real food scene going on? Is there collaboration between chefs and restaurants to up level, you know, just cuisines in general and to spread the word about Charleston as a food destination? Is that on the map? Charleston is absolutely a food destination. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, people come from all around. We've had, uh, you know, in the last, what, 20 years, we've had three James Beard chefs in town. Um, the, the variety of cuisine is amazing. Um, you, there's so many restaurants. Uh, if you name a cuisine, you can find it in Charleston and the surrounding islands. Um, it, the so that really lends itself to a restaurant like Jalisco because people are a little more open to exploring and trying different cuisines that maybe they weren't comfortable with 10 to 20 years ago but as we get all these different new cuisines just constantly popping up in Charleston it really is molding the palate of Charleston into something that's much more diverse than it was say 20 30 years ago Fantastic. I got to visit. I've never actually been to Charleston, but I've heard a lot about it. Oh, yeah. You love Charleston. Everybody loves Charleston. If you have spare time, do you like to cook at home for friends and family Absolutely. and that sort of thing? You do. And yes. what type of dishes are your favorites to prepare for friends and family when you have the time? Um, well, I, I like to cook all kinds of different cuisines at the, at, at the house. My wife is 
um, Filipino. And so uh, we cook a lot of Filipino food. Um, but my daughter uh, loves when I just do steak. So it's not unusual just to have like a big grilled steak, just simple mashed potatoes, some grilled asparagus. And she loves Bernays. So we got to have Bernays when we have the steak. Uh, but other than that, uh, I, I cooked for a long time before I did French food. I was I worked in Greek restaurants, so we'll cook some Greek food. Um, I was born in Germany. Um, I have an affinity for German food, so it's not unusual for us to dabble in schnitzels, rouladens, yeah. uh, sausages of different kinds. Uh, um, pretty much uh, we love Indian food. Um, we dabble in that, Thai cuisine, uh, just a whole diversity of stuff. And we're lucky my daughter really drinks it in. She's nine and she oh, enjoys awesome. all the different cuisines. Um, one wow. of her favorite things to eat is octopus. Yeah. So we'll wow. often have octopus. Um, yeah. Got an exploratory palate on that child. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I can't say that about my teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome, yeah. Chef. This is a business and an industry where you can literally start off in the dish pit and end up owning your own restaurants without a formal education. You got to work hard, of course, but you, this is a career that can take you around the world. I'm sure in your role as a leader, a trainer, a mentor, you've, you've impacted people's lives and you've seen them do really amazing things in this business. Any stories come to mind? Yeah. Uh, I have a ton of stories. Um, <laughs> I mean, a, a lot of them really come back to when I was chef de cuisine at Cacique on Kiwa. Um, I would cook for presidents, vice presidents. Awesome. Um, we king, cook for the King of Jordan. We would cook for all the executives of General Electric. Um, saw a lot of sports stars. I'd also fly on a uh, private jet to do multi-million dollar weddings at a sister clubhouse in Dunbeg, Ireland, um, where I saw everything from, you know, Bono from U2 to um, Patrick Harrington, a famous golfer. Um, you know, we fly down to St. Kitts where they were building another uh, club system um, and uh, uh, mega yacht uh, docks and the stories I'd have from there. Um, yeah, it's, uh, but the impact of my food, it goes back to what we talked about earlier going into the dining room, even all the way back to being a sous chef, it was not unusual. I love to go out and meet people and see how they really enjoy the food and get the feedback. And, and um, I've developed great friendships and relationships with people that I would not have met otherwise, just from them eating my food and coming into restaurants that I've worked at. And I have still friendships that I've maintained for over 20 years that have developed from these situations. That's a beautiful thing. Well, this is certainly a business of pride and passion, and you've certainly shared that with our audience today. Thank you so much for being with us, Chef. I appreciate your being on the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Thank you also to our audience for tuning in, and we hope to see you in the next episode. So stay tuned and stay well. Thank you, Mike. Talking everything kitchens and chefs and inspiration and all the things that make great restaurants run. I really appreciate you being a guest. Thanks also to our sponsors. Let me explain. Works is a CPA firm that will help you claim your employer retention tax credit money that you've already paid that uh, you can get back. All you need to do is contact Works. Please check out the uh, show notes for this episode on how to contact them. Smithfield Culinary, I've got to say, really amazing food. I was at a food show um, recently for Performance Foods. I do a lot of speaking um, for performance across the country. And Smithfield had a booth, and I tried all this food. And it's ready to eat and quick prepare foods that make your kitchen simpler to run. And I got to say, I tried the food. It was awesome. So check out Smithfield Culinary. Can't say enough about the birthday club. You know, I owned restaurants for 20 plus years. And had I still owned them now, um, I would certainly take advantage of the birthday club. Think about this. Um, everybody has a birthday and everybody knows somebody that has a birthday and birthdays are huge celebrations, right? In restaurants. Now your competitors are probably getting birthday business. Why are you missing out on this? The birthday club is a turnkey done for you system 
that uh, will bring you new and repeat business. So check out the Birthday Club. Again, contact information in our show notes. And finally, I'm really proud of Serve. Serve is a hospitality training app that is customized and bespoke to your operation. I'm actually a partner in this, and we have a team of people that are onboarding restaurants and give you a spectacular training tool front and back of house. Check that out at srvnow.com. Thanks for tuning in, and can't wait to see you next time. Imagine both your front and back of house teams are so well trained that they're executing flawlessly. Your front of house is doubling your sales, boosting repeat business, and creating five star dining experiences, while your back of house is consistently preparing each dish to perfection on time and to spec. Having a restaurant this dialed takes a unique training system. That's where Serve comes in. Serve means study restaurant variety. And it is a powerful, mobile training system, custom-built to meet the needs of your restaurant. Serve will up-level your team's knowledge and skills, maximize your profits, and create experiences guests will rave about. Picture this. Before the doors open for business, Susan, one of your managers, is assigning Serve training to Paul, your new bartender. Using the app, he will learn both food and beverage ingredients, allergens, romance notes, and pairings. She shows Paul how to use Serve's interactive study tools to become a master of the menu and how to use the cocktail database to easily find specs to make any drink. He can't wait to hit the floor and sees how Serve will unlock his hidden sales potential. Susan will be able to track his training progress and test his performance. I've got this, Paul says. Next, Susan just uploaded a brand new appetizer to the Serve menu using the admin dashboard. Using Serve's menu profit tools, she's determined that this new dish will have a major positive impact on the restaurant's bottom line if the team is able to sell it. So she makes it a priority sale item and gets your front of house team on board to suggest it throughout the night. Meanwhile, in the kitchen, Steve, your line cook, pulls out his phone and uses Serve to see prep notes on the new appetizer offering. Wow, he says, here are all the ingredients, the cooking steps, and a photo of the plate presentation. This makes it so easy to learn this dish. Sally, your server, returns to her table with drinks and says, may I now suggest you start with our new signature appetizer? It's the perfect complement to the chef's fantastic lobster special tonight that pairs wonderfully with a bottle of Whitehaven Sauvignon Blanc. That sounds wonderful, the guest says. We can't wait to try it. Sally learned these suggestive sales by studying pairings on Serve. Serve also allows you to up-level your management team with a comprehensive restaurant academy that includes efficiencies, inventory management, cost controls, and maximizing profit, menu engineering, proven marketing solutions, and more. Serve includes everything needed to develop your managers into rising stars in your operation. As the leader of your organization, you take pride in continuing to up-level your operation and your team. You know that by investing in your people, jobs become careers, and everyone in your team feels empowered to perform at their best. As you can see, the possibilities with Serve are endless. Serve is the key to unlocking your restaurant's hidden potential and will prove that the more your team is able to learn, the more your restaurant will earn. It's Serve, and it's a game changer. Ready to serve? Get started at srvnow.com. Thanks for listening to the Restaurant Rockstars Podcast. For lots of great resources, head over to restaurantrockstars.com. See you next time.